Hey everybody, welcome back to this series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one I'm going to be doing, doing the uh, Dragon Bane RPG, the box set and the uh, screen. Now, I know that everybody is doing a Dragon Bane review right now, so I figured I might as well get on the bandwagon. No, honestly, I, I ordered this a few, like almost a month and a half ago, and it just came this past week. That's one thing I'm going to start off this review by saying. I love this product, I think it's amazing. Free League's shipping is, is not great. So keep that in mind. Um, you're going to have to wait a while. I, I didn't hear anything. I didn't get any updates until I emailed them. And then immediately I got, like, tracking information. Things were shipped out, and it came within a few days. So, like, if you, if you, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease a little bit. Like, I think you kind of have to message them and ask them and, and get things going on their end. Um, I'm sure they're overwhelmed right now. This is blowing up. It's really, really successful, and I think you'll see why after I do this review. Now, again, I'm sure that lots of people have done these reviews recently, so you'll, you'll kind of get a sense, but I really like this. I think it's an awesome product. So first off, I want to go through the, uh, the screen itself. There's a box that I'll get to that in a second here. But the screen itself is really cool. It's a little bit small. What I mean by that is it's a little short. So you can see by my kind of my hand size, this is not very big. Maybe uh, not. Yeah, maybe uh, it's just not very large. But the inside, it's a three-panel screen, and the inside of it has what you might expect: um, all the kind of information you'll need to play the game. No art, except for just a you know accidental art, coins and a sword. Um, but the outside of the screen, as a whole, is pretty s simple. The middle panel is kind of where the interest is. That, that's the left side, and then you get the middle panel, which is where you get the dragon, and then kind of just swings off to the left. So really, it's it's kind of one panel of interest with a few kind of vague green shapes on the others. So the screen is good, totally sufficient, and it's useful because the inside information is actually good. Um, it's got fumble tables, it's got crit tables, it's got the sorts of things you would, um, well, I guess not really crit tables, but it's got fumble tables and it's got the rules for crits and things like that, NPC generation and journey rules and, and, and basic things you might want on a screen. Um, because this system does have some referencing that you're going to need to do while you play. And, and so this is a useful screen in that regard. It's not, you know, crazy, over-the-top awesome, but it's a good, solid screen. And I'd, I'd recommend you pick it up if you're going to play the game. Now, the box itself is fantastic. Uh, it's heavy, first of all. This is a heavy box because it's just full of stuff. Uh, other RPGs could take a lesson from the way that Dragon Bane fills out its box. First of all, the art is great. Classic art there. I love this guy down below, and the dragon is very menacing. The art in this box is really good all throughout. It's a couple artists who do almost all of it, and uh, they deserve all the credit. I love the just the <laughs> the title itself is so 80s. That's what I love about this game. It's like if I mean it obviously. Um, what is it? Dragons and demons, or the translation of it is what it was called in Sweden. Um, has been around since the 80s, and it came from RuneQuest. I'm not terribly familiar with RuneQuest, I have to, I have to admit. But um, this game is great. Mirth and Mayhem role-playing. Mirth and Mayhem, it's an interesting uh, combination, which I like. So inside the box set comes with lots of stuff, and it comes with, first of all, standees for the stuff I'll show later. A game catalog, as you might expect. And then the different cards. So you've got adventure cards and treasure cards. I haven't even taken these out of the, the packaging yet. I'm going to do it today because I think I'm going to play uh, a game of it today. Uh, but it's got initiative cards as well, and the initiative system is one of the really cool aspects of this box. I'll talk about it a bit. Um, but you've got uh, treasure cards and adventure cards, which are rumors and plot hooks and NPCs and things like that. And then you have treasure and um, some more treasure cards. The initiative cards, I like how it does initiative quite a lot. Now it came with two sets of dice, or rather sort of two and a half sets of dice. Um, this box set comes with uh, was 4d6, a whole set of dice um, with um, 2d20s and only 1d10. So it's not a d percentile included, but there are 2d20s in this. And then it also came with another package with uh, one set of each, uh, each die. Again, no d percentile, but one of each. Now the dice that come packaged in have a cool little feature. I don't know if you can see it, but the d20 is a demon skull and the 20 is worked into the horns. And the one is a dragon. And you don't know if you can see that but the one is worked into the body of the dragon. And the reason, of course, is that this is a roll under system, which I have to admit, you know, I've, I've said before, I don't like roll under systems all that much. 
Maybe it's just the sheer number of them that I've been going through recently in these reviews. They're starting to grow on me <laughs> just because I, I see so many of them and I'm like, oh, that's kind of interesting. That's an interesting way of doing this or that. Or, and, and this one in particular does a, a sort of its own take on a roll under system and especially as it relates to leveling up, which I'll talk about. And I think that's really cool. But um, so you want to roll a dragon. That's the idea. And the game mechanics call them dragons and demons. Uh, if your 20s are bad, rolling a demon, dragons are good and you want to roll, roll a one. And that sort of relates to the lore of the world. Both dragons and demons are sort of tyrannical, overpowering, dominant, but dragons are sort of more on the ordered side. They relate to the good guy, sort of, the historical good guy, and the demons are bad and chaotic and want to tear stuff down. So they're both really dangerous and powerful, and you're going to probably fight both. But dragons tend to be more good, and so the, uh, and so the uh, one is the dragon. So yeah, I think that's really cool, and the fact that it comes with a whole bunch of dice is a great way to start. Also, the fact that the die themselves, the die itself has the images on it, is helpful to kick players out of the "yes, I rolled a natural 20" feeling because you see the demon skull and you don't go "oh," but you don't go "yay," you go "uh oh," and you roll the dragon, and you go "yeah." So it, it actually helps to kind of acclimatize you to the. Uh, the, uh, the roll under system if you're used to more roll over systems so then you get the book now one of the races in this book are the mallards or <laughs> they're basically duck people this is just dark wing duck i showed this to my nephews and they immediately wanted to play this so it, it, it's good i mean it, it accomplishes what it wants to do i'm gonna turn this over really quick oh by the way yeah the back of the box has a similar piece of art and then it just shows what's in the content contents of the box so i'm going to um go through kind of the box set bit by bit first of all and the first thing we have here, I'll set this aside and I'll come back to it. The first thing we have is the rule book itself, Dragon Bane Rules. Now this is the entirety of the rule set. They released, or they're releasing a uh, physical copy, a hardback copy of the rules that is separate from the box set. From everything that I can tell, it's exactly the same as this splat book, this soft cover. But it has an additional adventure in the back. But otherwise it's the same. So if you have the box set, you don't necessarily need to get that new adventure book. Um, or that new, I should say, uh, player's guide core rule book because it has basically all the same thing in here. Um, now, the, the book itself, let me check really quickly, is 112 pages. Um, and it's good construction. It's definitely a splat book. I mean, it's, it's soft cover. It's, you know, glue bound. It's not the most um, strongest book in the world, but it's, it's solid. It's definitely solid. And I'd recommend, um, you know, picking it up because this whole box is an immense value. Um... You get the uh, cover page, and one thing you're going to see again throughout this book is amazing art. Um, there's the table of contents and a preface, and then you get this piece of art, which is such a perfect way to start off this book. It draws you in. I, I swear, when I saw this one piece of art, I said, okay, i got to get this game, because it's so um, flavorful. And the art throughout this entire book fits. It's the same two artists who do all the art, as far as I can tell, throughout the book. And most of the art is um, excellent. Almost all of it is at least very good. <laughs> There's one or two pieces that I'm like, eh, I'm fine with that. But for the most part, I love this style. It reminds me of old, like, Brothers Grimm fairy tale books, which I think is the vibe it's going for. And I just love this castle, and I love the wizard here pointing in the little mallard guy, if you can see him, <laughs> and then the uh, elf standing at attention. It's just a great little primer. You're about to have an adventure, and that's what this book, this with this piece of art makes me think of. Uh, and a cool adventure with, you know, huge castles and things like that. Um, so, as I said before, this is, um, it's a great book. It goes through what you might expect, uh, what a game is, who the players are, what the game master is, how you roll dice. Um, if you want to play online, playing solo, there are rules for solo play. Um, and then there is a great piece of art here with a Centaur, oops, Centaur taking it out on a fighter, about to smash him with a flail. Great piece of art. Um, you have abbreviations and what is a role-playing game, and I like it. it says if you have made it, if you've made it, your, <laughs> I think it says something like if you've made your way to this game, and you have ne you don't know what a role-playing game is before, congratulations, <laughs> you're like about to have a very interesting experience. And I like that they acknowledge that the most people who are going to have this book and find it are are going to know what a role-playing game is, and so. While I usually don't like this sort of advice and this sort of bits, it's limited and it's sort of aware of what it's doing. Um, and then you have to start playing and how you do it. Now, one of the cool things in this book is that you have a, every green section uh, is optional rules. 
that are not essential to the game, but they're almost all good. I don't I didn't think I came across a single optional rule that I was like, eh, I wouldn't use that. Um, there were a couple that at first I thought I wouldn't like, and then I thought about it more, especially in the context of the whole, and I, and I really do, you do like it quite a bit. Um, the game is it has how you measure time, and there are three basic kinds of time. There's rounds, stretches, and shifts. Um, and so rounds are 10 seconds, stretches are 15 minutes, and, and shifts are six hours. And so things, everything is divided into those three time frames. Things take rounds, things take stretches, things take shifts or multiple shifts or multiple rounds. So that's the division of time in this book. And I think it's a good six hours is an interesting amount of time for a shift. It, it makes it, um, you divide your days into quarters instead of thirds, right? Usually things are eight hours in D&D 5e, for example, and uh, this divides it into quarters, which is, um, I don't know, I think that's a more manageable chunk of time. Um, then you get the kin that this book has, and there are um, six of them. There are humans, and if you roll randomly, you're most likely to be human. Then there's halflings and dwarves, and then of course elves, mallards, and wolfkin are the six races kin in this book. Um, everyone is, speaks the common language, unless you are um, uh, one of the special races, in which case you, sp you speak your own race's language as well. And then if you want to communicate with other people, or you want to read ancient languages, or you want you have a, an actual understand languages skill, and so you can you can try to use that if you want to speak to people who speak a different language or communicate with them or read you know ancient texts in a ruin or something like that. It's an interesting way of doing languages. It kind of combines a few things into one. The races are pretty, or the kins I should say are pretty uh, laid out pretty straightforwardly. You just get uh, an ability, and that's basically all that the. Um, the particular race gives you is that they give you one or in one case two abilities which you can spend willpower points to to basically trigger and the willpower points are essentially it's like your mana points it's your spell slots sort of thing everyone has them they're equal to your will score which is your wisdom essentially um and and for most people they're going to use class and race or kin abilities by triggering these willpower points, but then wizards also trigger their spells off of willpower points. So, you know, you kind of have different uses for them. And then they also, a lot of effects in the game trigger off of willpower points. So things will decrease them, bad conditions, horrible effects. And then if you're at zero and you lose more, then bad stuff starts to happen to you. So it's, it's a sort of secondary hit point pool as well. You have, you know, hit points, of course, but you also have these willpower points, um, which are interesting and you recover them in, in particular ways and things like that halflings and dwarves, elves, and then you have mallards. Mallards get two. And one of them is ill-tempered, which makes me think of Donald Duck, which is awesome. Um, so you can play Donald Duck if you want, right? He's always losing his temper. And in this, that's an, an ability you can trigger with willpower points, is losing your temper. You get some advantage, but you also become angry, which is a condition. And then the wolfkin, which are really cool. And then you have, um, again, just breakdowns of all their abilities. You have names. And then they each have sort of... Um, age ranges that are associated with them and i'll talk more about that in a minute but otherwise the races are are, are all identical they have different speeds base speeds as well i forgot they all move differently depending on the race but that's it you have movement you have age and that's not the, the precise age isn't important it's more for role-playing purposes and then the um and then the uh willpower abilities the abilities and that's it that's all your kin gives you but then you get professions and there are 10 professions um, so six kin, ten professions, so quite a few combinations. You can have uh, artisans or bards, fighters, uh, hunters, knights, mages, mer mariners, merchants, scholars, and thieves. And each of them essentially gives you a key attribute, which is what kind of what you want to have high if you want to play it, a set of skills that you can choose from, and then you get a heroic ability, and heroic abilities are things that... Um, Basically kind of like feats, they make your character stand out a bit. You start off with one, depending on your thing. And then you have uh, gear. You can either choose which package to start with or roll on the packages. And then it has nicknames that are associated. So you have a first name from your kin, and then you have a nickname from your profession. You can do it however you want, but that's just how it suggests doing it. So, and that's all your profession gives you, is it gives you basically a skill package and one set feat, and then a, and then a, a gear package. After that, it's up to you to create your own character. And I think that's so cool because the skills are how you do everything. This is a skill-based game. So one of the ways you determine how many skills you have is your age. Um, you always get at least eight. Six class skills. So you get six skills and you can pick six out of the eight that are given in your little um, class. So every, every class, every um, profession, I should say, has eight skills that are in the skill section. You pick six of those that you start with. 
or that you're trained in. And then other than that, if you're young, uh, you get uh, two extra skills and you can choose from anywhere. And your agility and constitution go up by one. If you're an adult, you get four extra skills you can choose from anywhere and you don't, your stats don't change. And if you're old, you get six extra skills and your agility and constitution decrease by two, but your intelligence and will increase by one. So age matters. There's a really solid reason to play an old character. And I think that's really cool because very often it's just kind of a flavor and, um, and you don't really think about how that affects you as a person, you know, to age and to become more wise, hopefully, to become more intelligent, to have more experience of the world, uh, and to become trained in more things, or, you know, to have that young uh, health and vigor, uh, but be a little less, um, a little less, uh, you know, able to, to act and stuff like that, <laughs> a, little, a little less skilled. I think that's really cool. Um, you have six basic abilities. You have strength, constitution, agility, intelligence, willpower, and charisma. It's essentially the six from D&D. Agility is dexterity, willpower is wisdom, of course. Um, and it talks about how you generate your stats. Now, it's, it's an interesting way. You roll 4d6 and drop the lowest. So in that way, it's like D&D &D 5e or 3rd edition or other books. But you, you choose where that goes, but you do it each time you roll. So you roll 4d6, drop the lowest, you have a score, and then you choose where to assign that. And then you roll for the next one. So you don't get to see your whole array and choose where they go. You have to go point by point. So you're like, well, this is a good roll. So I'll put it in intelligence because I don't want to be a dumb character. But, you know, you, you don't know. You might roll really well later. And you would have rather put that in intelligence and now you have to put it somewhere else. So it's an interesting um, flexibility, um, but also a little bit of a limitation. So you can't just make the character you absolutely want. You, you are going to have to make sort of a bit of a compromise or a cost-benefit analysis. I rolled really well. Do I want to put this in something valuable or do I want to hold off and see if I roll higher later? Now, at the very end, after you've done all six, you can swap two. So you do have, you know, okay, I need a key ability. I'm going to make it my highest. Um, but otherwise, it's a little bit more limiting, and I actually like that. I think that's a kind of a cool way of doing it. Um, now, it's a roll under system. But the roll under system isn't simply, you don't roll under your stat directly. There's actually a conversion. So if you have an attribute of, it's over here. So if you have an attribute of one to five, your base chance is three. So you have to roll, if you have a one to five in a stat, you have to roll under three to get it, three or under. If you have a six to eight, then you have to roll under four. Nine to 12 is a five, 13 to 15 is a six, and 16 through 18 is a seven. So even if you have an 18 in a stat, which is the highest you could have to start, um, you could have a 19, I suppose, because you could have plus one from your age. So 18 plus, uh, I think, actually, no, I think it says it maxes out at 18 now that I think about it. But regardless, um, you only have a seven out of 20 chance, right? Because the, the seven or lower on an 18. So what you want is do you want to get that um, skill because skills double your base chance. So if you have a... Uh, a trained skill in, in one of the, in say it's charisma based, then instead of, and you have a three, instead of having a three, you have a six. And if in fact you have an 18 in a charisma skill, say, and you're trained in that skill, then you have a 14. So the, but the highest you could start with is a 14, which is really cool. It's not insanely high, but it's significantly high and you're still fairly likely to succeed, but that's if you have an 18 and you're trained in it. Otherwise, it's gonna be much lower. So I think that's a cool way of doing it. It's a roll under system. It's not strictly like, okay, here's, I, I happen to roll an 18 and now I'm very unlikely to fail something from level one, right? I don't really like that, um, but I like that it's a little bit more rounded off with the emphasis on lower, right? So three, four, five, six, seven, even doubled up to 14. Um, you're gonna have between a three and a 14 in every stat or in every skill to start. So that, that tends to go on the lower side of things, which is cool. I like that, I'm glad that it's lower because um, it means leveling up matters more. Uh, then you have really quickly, you have kin and the different uh, speeds. And then if you have higher agility or lower agility, that base uh, kin speed is raised or lowered. So if you're an elf, you have a base movement of 10 meters per round. And if you have high agility, you get plus two to that, say 13 to 15, you're plus two. Or if you have an eight, 16 to 18, you get a plus four. So the base chance is based on your kin, but then your agility modifies it, which is cool. Um, so you can be a very slow wolfkin, wolfkin are the fastest by base, or you could be a very fast halfling. But, you know, the very fast halfling he has a 12 movement, which is about his average, those are the wolfkin average. If you have very high strength, you get a strength bonus, a damage bonus to all of your attacks. You get to add either a d4 or d6 if you're of a high strength. So um, 
yeah, it gives you an additional bonus to do damage with weapons. Otherwise, if you have 12 or lower for strength, you don't do any additional damage. You don't add anything to your rolls. You just use the base rolls of the dice. Um, oh yeah, the last thing is that um, you get hit points and willpower points, which is just hit points are equal to your constitution and willpower is equal to your willpower. And hit points, that's it. So there's really, and, and as you'll see, there's not really a way to gain more hit points or more willpower points as you level up. So what you have at the start is pretty much where you're going to be. Now there are ways to modify that and, and things as you go through with feats and heroic abilities, basically. But for the most part, um, for the most part, you're going to be pretty much where you are from the start. Uh, which means that your skills are going to go up rather than your hit points and your attack bonus and all this stuff. Well, your attack bonus goes up as your skill goes up. Because weapon skills are skills like any other skills. There's no difference. And it's the same thing with spells. Spells are particular um, kinds of skills. They're secondary skills. So they're triggered off of your main abilities, but they're, they level up their own way. So everything is built into that one system, and I like that. I like games which have one system or you know simple systems to go through all your things. Heroic abilities with weaknesses, and weaknesses are an interesting little mechanic there. You get gear. Encumbrance is simple. A certain number of items in your hand, a certain number of items on your person, and then you can hold a certain number of items in your pack, and that's it. It's based on your strength, if you can hold more or less, and you can become over-encumbered if you go up past a certain point, but um, it's very difficult. Experience is a very interesting way, uh, the feature of this game, the way that experience and leveling up works. So, um, anytime you roll a dragon or a demon in for any skill check, you make a little tick mark, mark next to that skill. And at the end of the session, you roll for each tick mark. And if you roll higher than the skill it's associated with, that tick mark is next to you, then that skill goes up. So essentially, you're learning from your victories and your defeats. You're learning from your great successes and your failures. It's really cool. A lot, a lot of systems don't do that. And so that's how your skills go up. You don't gain levels. You just succeed or fail a lot, <laughs> or well, or badly. And you learn from it, and your character gets better as he levels up. And, and so you have to roll higher than your skill level, so it gets harder to level it up as you level up. So it, it's sort of a balance there, built-in balance. Um, if you have a 13 in, say, um, seamanship, which is one of the skills, and you roll a dragon in a seamanship check, uh, test, then you make a checkbox and a check mark next to it. Uh, just one, so it doesn't matter if you, you, you do it twice or three times in a session, just it's, it's either you have the check or you don't. You don't do multiple. And um, for each skill. And then at the end of the session, you roll. And if you roll above that 13, then you go up to 14. But if you roll 13 or below, then you just stay the same at that skill. Now, th th that's, the, that's one way of, of leveling up skills. The other ways of doing it are you ask, at the end of each session, you ask a series of questions, or the DM does. Did you participate in this session? If so, then you can choose a skill to put a check mark next to. Uh, did you explore a new location? If so, you can choose a skill to put a check mark next to. Did you defeat one or more uh, dangerous adversaries? And it's defeat, not kill, which is cool because you can do it differently. And did you overcome an obstacle without using force? Also cool because it means, okay, is there a way we can get, if, if we sneak past the monster or overcome the trap, we can get experience that way too. And then finally, did, did you give in to your weakness? That's one of the things. If you give in to your weakness, you can check off uh, another experience point. So it encourages role-playing. Instead of just getting inspiration for playing your character's flaws, you get experience for playing your character's flaws. So it really, really encourages... Yeah, so you know, in 5e, you just get an inspiration point to use as, to give yourself advantage. And there's so many ways to get advantage in that game that it's, almost, it's just never worth it. But here, your weakness is an extra experience point, an extra chance to level up a skill, which is really good. Um, and then uh, magic is similar. Uh, you can get teachers to train you, but uh, in limited places. And then you get heroic abilities when you reach certain tiers of skills. Uh, basically, when you get 10, 18, you get a heroic ability in that skill. Uh, and then heroic abilities are basically feats. So that's that's the basic character stuff. As you can see, it's a really cool system. I like it a lot. I think it works really, really well. Um, rolling the dice, how that works. Rolling a dragon, and there are um, crit successes, basically, and then crit failures. Rolling a demon. It's really good to roll a dragon, even in non-combat situations. So unlike in 5e, 5th edition, or a lot of D&D games where critical success matters in combat, but it doesn't really matter outside of combat. In this, it explicitly says, no, it, it, it improve your results somehow. It's going to be up to the DM to figure out, the GM to figure out, but um, 
but it's up to you. And then there's, if you roll a demon, it, it goes badly, regardless of the circumstances. Boons and Banes are this game's essential versions of uh, advantage and disadvantage. Boons, that you roll two and take the lower. The, uh, Banes, like you let you roll two and take the higher. The difference with these is that they do stack up. So, um, whereas, you know, in other games like 5th Edition or Shadow Dark, you can only ever either have uh, a Boon or a Bane, right? And if you ever have both, you just roll normally. It doesn't matter how many are advantages, right? So you get four sources of advantage and one source of disadvantage. You just roll flat. You just roll one die. Um, in this, they actually cancel each other out. Uh, boon to bane. So if you get three boons and two banes, you roll with one boon. One extra boon, basically, right? Because you have three to two. Or if you have four boons and no banes, you get four extra dice and you roll and take the lowest. So boons, getting lots of sources of boons matters. And avoiding multiple sources of banes matters. It's not just once you have it, you're like, ah, whatever, I'll just take on a bunch of extra bad things too. I'll make it harder because I'm, you make it very unlikely to succeed if you have three or four banes, for example. And then you have something called pushing the roll, which a lot of people are familiar with. You can try again after you fail, but if you fail again, bad stuff happens. Um, you start to take one of the conditions, and there's a condition associated with each of the ability scores. Exhausted, sickly, dazed, angry, scared, and disheartened. And if you have that condition, you have disadvantage, you have a bane on any checks that have those uh, associated with that ability. So you can push it, you gotta be careful to push it. It's really, you only do it if you're really important. Like, now that's an optional rule, obviously you don't have to do it. And then there's also helping, which is an optional rule. Um, oppose roles and how those work. If you're familiar with roll under systems, this works the same way. And then you have the core skills, which is all the basic skills in the game. And you have heroic abilities, which are your feats. Some of them have requirements and uh, the, how much, how many willpower points they cost to use. Some of them are free, some of them uh, are two, some of them are three. Uh, there might be some that are one, yeah. I don't think there are any that are four though. At least I didn't come across them. Um, and again, remember, willpower is your sort of magic mana pool as well. So if you're a caster, you're gonna have fewer heroic abilities. In fact, it, you don't start with any, except for your um, kindred ones. Um, and you have how combat works. And this, I really wanted to highlight this really quickly, because I know this will probably be a bit of a longer video, but I wanted to highlight this. Initiative is really cool. So basically you have those initiative cards and that's how it works. You pass out initiative cards every round. Um, so your initiative order changes round to round. Now, if you, have, if you have surprise, you can choose which card you want, which is cool. You don't have to go first. You can choose to let the enemies go first, but you can choose your order. Um, and at any point, you can always wait and trade your initiative card with any other card that's lower in the initiative, so long as it hasn't already been traded for, right? So um, that's, I think that's really cool. You can basically you know, pass the buck to the other person. Now, why would you wanna do that? Well, there are certain circumstances in which having the enemy go first would be really helpful. One of the mechanics in this game is the ability to dodge or parry. So depending on the kind of attack, depending upon your equipment and what you're wearing and all that stuff, you can choose to dodge or parry an attack as a reaction, but you can only do that if you haven't acted yet. So for example, say you go first in a combat, this is the example that they give. Say it's you against an enemy in a, in a duel and you draw the first card. Well, maybe you should trade with him and let him go first because if he attacks and hits you, then you can use your dodge or parry to negate the attack. But if he attacks and misses you, then you can take an attack back to him. Whereas if you go first, you have to choose right then or there if you to attack him, and then you lose your opportunity to parry if he hits you. So that's one reason why you might. But of course, if you do that, if you hit him and kill him, then you don't have to worry about his attack at all. So it gives you a bit of like, okay, maybe I should go first, maybe I should wait, maybe I should let myself have my action left. Because when you dodge or parry, which I think is really cool, you lose your action. You can't act that round. So it's a real cost-benefit analysis to choose to dodge or parry. Yeah, you can completely negate the attack, but now you can't act. So initiative is really cool, and those initiative cards are a quick way of doing it. So I highly recommend getting them or, or making them if you don't get them, if you're going to play this game. Really cool to have. It makes it much, much faster. And now waiting is technically an optional rule, but I would play with it, absolutely. Um, actions, you get an action and a move. That's it. An action and a move, nothing else. <laughs> you don't get bonus actions. Reactions, you can use in anyone's turn, but they take your action to use. So if you've already used an action, you can't use a reaction. Occasionally there's a free action. There are some described here, like drawing a weapon, um, change your position so you can drop to the ground or stand up. Uh, you can draw an item or you can shout. 
but you can't, so, and then there are subcategories, so drawing a weapon, exchanging a weapon, putting a weapon away are all under the draw weapon free action category. And you can only do one of those subcategories. You can't do all three. So that you have basically four free actions you can do. You can draw a weapon, you can change your position, you can drop an item, and you can shout, or some variation of each of those, but you can't do two of each. You can't shout twice, right? Or you can't uh, draw two items, or drop two items, or something like that. Um, basic movement, this game is done in meters. So if you're from the U.S., you'll have to do some translations, as I will, because <laughs> um, I'm not as familiar with meters as I am with feet and yards. But it's actually pretty simple. I mean, once you do it well, a couple times, you get the, get the hang, hang of it. You're, you're lo basically, if you're using squares, if you're using like a grid map, then you just have two meter squares as opposed to five foot squares. That's the basic difference. Uh, anyone can sneak attack. You just have to succeed on a sneaking check. And if you do, you can um, get a bane or rather get a boon. And um, if you have a certain kind of weapon, called a subtle weapon, you can do extra damage. So anybody can sneak attack. Now, obviously, the Thief class has heroic abilities associated with sneaking and has skills that will probably lend themselves to sneaking, but you can be a sneaky fighter. You can be a sneaky merchant. You can be an artisan who knows how to sneak up really well and smash them with a hammer, right? Um, and then you get free attacks. Uh, basically, if you step away from somebody without making an evade roll, doesn't take an action to do so, then the enemy gets to attack you. So you can, you can if you have a high evade, you can avoid uh, opportunity attacks, basically. Um, basic rules for terrain, basic rules for rough terrain or dimly lit, uh, for cramped spaces, um, piercing weapons you can use in cramped spaces without any problem, which is cool, you're stabbing. And some weapons have slashing and piercing as options. And then there are lots of things you can do too. There are damage types, and there's reasons to use different damage types. Some creatures are resistant, some creatures are immune. Um, some damage types can be used in certain circumstances. Like I just said, piercing can be used in damp or in cramped positions, um, conditions, which is cool. Critical hits, you get one of these three choices uh, when you critically hit. And um, if you roll a demon in combat, in melee, bad stuff happens. Um, you don't want to roll a... Uh, a uh, demon in melee. And of course, the same thing is here for ranged. You don't want to roll a demon for ranged. You do special attacks, and there are special rules for uh, find weak spot or disarm or grapple if you want to use those. Um, and then you have damage and the different damage types. Armor is really cool. Armor is simply damage reduction. And one of the things you can do is if you have really heavy armor, like plate armor, for example, its damage reduction is six. And if a weapon ever... Uh, is reduced to zero if the da if the attack of the weapon damage on the attack is reduced to zero by your armor reduction, then the weapon is damaged or breaks, which is really cool. So you're like, shattering your sword on the enemy's armor or on the monster's hide if it has really high armor um, reduction. Helmets add to that. Um, really cool ru rules for picking people back up. One of the cool things about dying in this game is that you can rally them. So even if they are dying, they're still taking saving throws. They're still in the... It, it, the death saves are kind of like D&D &D 5e. You have three successes versus three failures and try to get to one before the other. Um, but if you're rallied, and you can try to rally yourself with a persuasion roll, you can keep fighting even though you have zero hit points. Every hit that you take is a, is a fail on your death save, so it's dangerous. You're running around the battlefield still, but you can still do it, which is really funny. I like that. Um, you get severe injuries and conditions if you want to play with those rules. Healing and then other kinds of hazards, you know, falling... Uh, disease and poison, fear, swimming and drowning, and then hunger, cold, all of that. One of the things is that a lot of this stuff is very mechanical. So there are rules for sleeping, sleep deprivation, cold, and how you, how, what happens if you don't do those things, hunger. It's, it's very particular. Instead of just taking like levels of exhaustion, like in 5e, um, there are kind of sub-rules. It's simple sub-rules, but there are sub-rules for each of these. Really great piece of art there. Oh, man, I love that one. You have uh, spells. Magic is essentially, you get general magic, and then you get three kinds of magic, animism, mentalism, um, or elementalism. And then uh, you pick one when you become a, a mage. There's only one casting class at first in the base game. They said they might add more in future supplements, but there's only one base caster, so you get all general spells or access to them. And then you get access to one particular kind of magic, animism, elementalism, or mentalism. Um, you have to level up individual spells. Because into each individual spell is a, uh, or rather it's a kind of magic, and you have to rank it up, I should say. So each, each kind of um, area of magic is an individual spell, or an individual skill. There's casting times, durations, ranges. Now one of the really cool things 
uh, the magical mishaps. So if you roll a 20 when you're casting your spell, if you roll a demon, then you roll on the magical mishap table, and if you roll another demon, you just summon a demon. <laughs> but some of these are really interesting. Like you can age and actually age, or you can um, become way younger. You can take one of the random conditions, take some damage. Um, interesting stuff. How to learn new magic, and then the different spells you can do. One of the cool things is that magic, general magic, gives you three, uh, you get magic, seal, charge, and permanence, which are three higher level spells. You can create your own magic items. Uh, and basically you bind other spells into items and you can make it permanent if you want to cast all the levels of the tier. So you have to kind of combine uh, different spells to do that. But there's a base game way to create your own magic items. It's hard, it takes um, takes time, you have to be high level, and it takes permanent willpower points. You reduce your willpower permanently if you cast the permanent spell. Um, but you can make your own magic items in the base game. That's super cool. Um, because anyone can use magic items. Um, so you pick your different kinds. Yeah, elementalism, of course, has some fire spells, as you might expect. Mentalism has stuff like flight and teleport, telepathy, dominate. You really have to pick and choose. You can't take the best of every school of magic because you can only pick one school of magic to learn. You have gear and what it does, and there are lots of different kinds of gear, and they all actually do things. There are differences between the weapons. There are differences between the, um, the pieces of armor you can get, between the trade goods you can find and buy. They actually do things in-game, which is cool. That, that list of gear that you can keep with you actually has mechanical effects, and they seem useful to me, at least. Um, again, medicine, uh, containers, tools, light sources, services, all that. And you get the bestiary. The bestiary has lots of cool creatures. Now, one of the cool things about the monsters in this is that they have ferocity, and that's how many initiative cards they draw, and they act on every initiative card. So monsters, especially some that have two or three ferocity, like the dragon has three ferocity, um, they are really tough. They have 80, like a dragon has 84 hit points, armor six, there's armor reduction six, and he's got movement 24, which is for the whole round, not just each, or for the whole turn, not just for each of his rounds. He can move 24 meters, um, in each, uh, combined throughout all three of his turns, or all three of his rounds. He has a special wings and what that does, and then he has monster attacks. Now, every monster uses monster attacks. You roll, you can choose, but I recommend rolling. It makes it more interesting for what that monster does that turn. And because, he's, for example, the dragon is Frosty 3, you're going to roll three times, because you're going to roll once for his first action, and then once for his second action, and once for his third. And it says he d the monsters can never do the same thing twice in a row. So if you do, you just go down one to the next one on the table. But you've got demons, dragons, ghosts, giants, giant spiders, creatures, goblins, griffins, harpies, manticores, minotaurs, orcs. Lots and lots of stuff. Now there is a, a bestiary that's been, uh, that is available, and you can uh, pre-order the print version of it. You can actually get the PDF of it already if you buy the print version, and it has many, many, many more monsters. I already have that. <laughs> I bought that. It's really cool. Um, so I'd recommend getting that one as well, because there's a lot more creatures in it, and they're really interesting, some of them at least. And then adventures and how to do that. Um, you get mishaps on the road, cold rules, typical NPCs, and how to run them. Uh, good advice in that area. Uh, and then different kind of tables for creating your adventures. So there are three tables, and you just take one of each die, a d4, d6, d8, d10, d12, and d20, and you roll it, and it gives you what the quest is. And then you do it again, and you get the journey to the destination, what the journey is like, and then you get the adventure site. And what the, so you roll it three times, and you have a pre-made adventure all set. It's really cool. You know, you'd have to do your own maps and stuff and think of some of the details, but the basic structure is given to you. And then what a campaign is with the appendices. So that's the base Dragon Bane book. That's what you get in the rule book. Really cool stuff. I think this is fantastic. I'm going to quickly run through the rest of this box set. The second book that you get in the box set is the adventure book. Um, the adventure book is pretty good. It's not my favorite. I think the quests are pretty cool. Some of them are really cool. Um, but it's obviously pretty like you go here and then you do this. And some of the adventures are pretty scripted. A couple of them are at least. There's events that occur to you. Those are Those are less interesting to me than ones that are more open. Uh, and the dungeons are pretty, you know, there's there's not that much going on in a lot of the dungeons. They're pretty small. That being said, it's a great introduction, I think, to the system. And it would be great for new players, um, especially if you are just trying to figure out the game. This would be a, a good, solid set of book. Now, it has a lot of stuff in here. This book is also, it's 116 pages. And it's a cool quest. You get cool magic items and you 
run across cool NPCs, and it, it definitely is good. I, I'm going to run this when I run the, this game. I'm going to use this base adventure and see how it is. But I think pretty quickly I'll probably move into generating my own. Um, once again, the art is great. I'm just going to do a quick flip through. There's a great map of the hole. And you get good art throughout with uh, particular details located or, or particular details of the locations and maps, submaps. Um, you get some random events going on and you get some NPC art. And the NPC art is really good. Uh, the town maps are good. It's all totally good. I have no complaints about the the formatting, the, the writing, anything except just the actual design of the adventures. I think it's a little, it's just not my favorite. But the uh, the way it's presented and the art in here and the, uh, you know, again, I haven't played this, so I don't know how it would actually go to the table. But my, my, my feeling is that at least some of these adventures are pretty much like you go to this room and this happens, you go into that room and this happens, and you go to the next room and you learn the secret and you fight the bad guy and then you move on. And, Something, some kind of stuff kind of like that. There is some choice, obviously, um, but it's it's a little bit more limited, it seems to me. Um, but here's an example of one of the dungeons. You can see it's pretty straightforward, right? It's not it's not huge. That's, of course, the underground level. You start here and you get a couple paths, but it's just really just a couple rooms, and then you go down below, and you get a few choices with subrooms and then a big last room. That's kind of a lot of the dungeons in the game are like that. But again, you just get great art of NPCs, gives you a sense of what you're looking at. Um, and it's all broken down very, very well. The actual design of the page, giving you information where bad things are, bolded in red, if you can't see it, bolded in green, uh, bullet points, rooms divided up, you have maps close by, NPCs are given side box. It's really well designed. Um, so the, the, the construction of the book and the, the uh, presentation of the adventures is really, really good. Now, a couple last things that I want to cover here, um, and that's the last stuff that comes in the box set. So you get um, pre-made characters, and I'll, I'll say this for them. Um, I don't usually use pre-made characters, but I think I'm going to use these because, um, again, I showed these to my nephews who are going to be playing this game, and they were interested in running them. They actually were like, ooh, that guy's cool, and oh, she's kind of cool, and uh, they like them. Now, of course, this guy was by far the favorite, Macander of Half Bay. Uh, they want to play him. A couple of my nephews are like, oh, we got to play the duck guy. Um, so we'll see. No one really wanted to play the halfling, but that's, you know, uh, uh, the old wizard guy, super cool. And then everyone also wants to play the, uh, the wolfkin. And I think that's what you're going to find is that this book appeals to um, a lot of people. Obviously, it appeals to me, and I don't really like, you know, animal people very much. But it's very popular with younger, younger players. And so I think it's a nice blend of of more mature uh, tone with uh, enough stuff that appeals to young players that you could use this certainly as a uh, as an introduction to the, the hobby. Um, so good, five good pre-made characters. You also get a really great player map of the adventure. And I think you're supposed to give this to the players early. One of the first adventures they get is a, uh, they find a map. On the back of it is all the great starters. Um, but on the front of it, you get a really cool map of the region. Really great detail, beautiful artwork. Um, this is something you, know, you give to your players and they're going to go, whoa, and they're going to look at it and it's going to be great. You get the Misty Vale, which is where this region is, and the city of Out, or the town of Outskirt, which is kind of your home base. So this is a great thing to include in a PDF, or in a, in a PDF. <laughs> it's a great thing to include in a box set. And I wish, I wish, wish, wish other box sets came with stuff like this. In addition, as you guys are, I'm sure, aware, you get standees. As I already showed you, those little plastic standees, you get the, the um, cardboard guys. This is for all the monsters in the, um, in the box and a lot of the heroes. You get one at least of each race, kin, I should say, excuse me, and you get all the little guys. Uh, for goblins, multiple goblins, a couple of orcs, and you, know, you can obviously double up and use your own, but this is awesome that it comes with this. So few games do this. And the, it's just such a generous box set, really. That's what I, I say over and over. This is, you know, you can say what you will about the game. You can you can say, ah, it's not my favorite, it's not my quality, but or it's not my preference. But the quality of the box set and what you get is just really awesome and admirable. And I wish, I, I hope, it sets a standard. You get a bunch of blank character sheets. This is, uh, they're all, there's 10 of them and they're double-sided. 
for two or five of them, and they're double sided, so you get ten total. A cool, really cool character sheet, and you get a sense of what the, this looks like. These are all your skills broken down. Then you get the ephemera up here, name, appearance, kin, uh, uh, profession, and your weakness, your age. And then you have your six base stats, along with boxes to check check off if they uh, if they get sick or if they get dazed or whatever. All the different conditions. Damage strength bonus, agility strength bonus, your movement, your uh, inventory a limit, your encumbrance, your abilities and spells, gold, silver, copper, armor, helmet, and what those do for you, your weapons you're carrying, willpower, hit points, your inventory, and then tiny items along with a memento. And that's what you get. So, oh, and then finally, actually, sorry, <laughs> two last things. You get a really brief uh, double-sided battle map, which again, it's simple, but it's awesome that it includes that. You don't have to go elsewhere uh, if you want to play this game on a, on a grid. You get wilderness and you get dungeon. Super cool. And then finally you get a little booklet for solo play. I, I, I really honestly can't believe that I've gotten so used to um, box sets where this sort of stuff is, is just, you know, not, not included. Like, I mean, I think we're all just sort of used to getting the bare minimum in our, in our box sets because of how, I don't know, because of just what people give us, <laughs> what the companies give us. But this, it, it kind of goes above and beyond and it shows you what's possible. Um, and I think it's a great, great idea. It's so generous, and it is great quality, too. The, uh, the, the stuff you're looking at, the art, the design of the game, um, the sensibilities behind it are, are old school, but it has enough... Um, like, for example, characters are a bit more survivable. You're not gonna, your hit points aren't going to change. You don't have to worry about hit point bloat. But they don't start off super, super weak. Um, you, you start off with, you know, between probably around 10, 15 hit points, and you get three death fails, and when you, if you succeed three times, you could get 2d6 hit points back, so pretty survivable, and you have plenty of opportunities to be healed if you have an animism or an animancer, they're the ones that get spells, healing spells, and if you don't have that, then you're going to be relying more on medicine checks and on rallying checks, persuasion and medicine, but otherwise, um, it's, you're pretty survivable. Solid books. You get a ton in this box set. Um, again, highly, highly recommend this product. I know that uh, a lot of people have been going through reviews of this, and uh, I think a lot of people are, are, are saying similar things that I'm saying. It's good, you know, really good. Um, I haven't heard a lot of people say, I'm going to start playing this as my new system. Now, I don't think I'm going to be replacing Shadow Dark with this, but I am definitely going to be using this um, alongside Shadow Dark moving forward. Because this is so much, it's so interesting, and it's, it looks like so much fun. And the art is great. The uh, the aesthetic is very much appeals to me. And uh, I think you guys would be well um, well served to have got a copy yourself if you don't already have it. All right, guys. Well, I hope this has been interesting, and uh, I'll talk to you all in another video.